What does a piece of ground signify? Place to mow. Place to build. Place to call home. Place to worship. This piece of ground has supported children playing games during vacation Bible school. Surrounded families as they played together. Provided a piece of stability for a meal and fellowship. This piece of ground did not always look this way. Other buildings occupied this land. People who were not with us today put in their blood, sweat, and tears to make it viable. Other people who now sit with God in a re heavenly realm claimed this rich earth. They gave of their time, their gifts, their energy, and their hard-earned dollars to establish something significant here. Since 1888, this piece of ground has transformed from dirt to grass, to concrete, to masonry and brick, and to building after building after building. But since 1888, the people of God have witnessed some great things here. Weddings, baptisms, revivals, celebrations, puppet shows, moments for learning, and funerals, and tragedies, and times of grief. It is what the church is supposed to be, a place of sharing Christ through our faith and our actions. Thank you for joining us for today's worship. Over the next few minutes, you will see some of the highlights of our ministries. And then we will worship the God who has been here with the people for 133 years and for another 133 years to come.
guys, look at that. That's amazing. Uh huh. Wow, look over there. Have you guys seen anything as massive as that? Great. Those cliffs are huge. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Well, we're here. Looks like everyone else just got here too. It's time to look up. There's more to life than what's on your screen. Go off-road on the adventure of a lifetime and experience the greatness of God's love. Explore colorful canyons of the Southwest from a rock-solid faith and discover that God is monumental.
thank you for gathering for worship here this morning. And uh, just want to make sure uh, I'm not showing anything that we're not live, but are we recording? We're recording. Okay, so we'll, we, uh, we apologize and we'll certainly get the worship service up this afternoon as soon as we uh, kind of figure out what's going on here. But it's all right. We've, it is time for worship here in person. And so I invite you to uh, stand if you are comfortable as we sing hymn number 2226, Bind Us Together. standing please join me in the call to worship great spirit of god you have healed our wounds you have brought us from the past of hurt and anger you have blessed our life that we might be a blessing to others let us worship you in great joy let us remember the ways you have turned our morning into dancing that binds. gathered here and standing, um, take this opportunity and share in what we refer to as the ritual of friendship. This is a wonderful opportunity to say hello to those gathered around us. And even though we're not streaming live, make sure you do a wave on those in the live stream. Good morning, Good morning. sweetheart. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Good. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so we'll we'll do the baptism when they get there. Sure. <laughs> they thought the church was at 10:30. So they're they'll they'll okay. we'll, we'll do the baptism when they get there. Okay. okay. Sounds good. to respond to someone online. OK. 
Okay, there we go. All right. So we, uh, we gather here uh, for uh, a few announcements to want to lift up for your attention. And um, so next week uh, is not only Mother's Day and the celebrations around that, but it's also confirmation. And so we will have uh, Confirmation Sunday, not only here at the 930 service, but uh, there will be one additional confirmand at the, at the service at Central. That will be in the afternoon uh, for myself. But I invite you to uh, uh, come and celebrate with our confirmands. Um, because of the pandemic, this year we're gonna have eight, we usually come confirm eighth graders, uh, but uh, since we didn't have a class last year, and it was modified. It's going to be eighth and ninth graders, and so, but uh, that will be going on next week, and uh, we celebrate with that. And so, we invite you to come at the service at 9:30. At nine o'clock, we're gonna, we've got a photographer coming, and so you'll, we'll be busy taking pictures and things like that. But uh, that'll be taking place at 9:30, and um, um, so hopefully by then next week we'll have everything all figured out with the live stream, so you at home will be able to watch that as well. Um, do have a, a couple of um, folks that uh, have contacted me uh, with some prayer requests. Um, so on May 2nd, tomorrow, is Shirley Ekdahl's birthday. And uh, Lauren also said she graduated from rehab this week. Uh, so, uh, so Shirley, uh, congratulations. Uh, I know you'll be able to watch the service this afternoon. Uh, we'll be singing happy birthday to you and congratulations on, the, on, the, on graduating from rehab. And, and she'll be coming back with a brand new knee. So we'll get to welcome her knee to Nebraska uh, when she comes back. Uh, and then um, Kim Walker is asking for prayers. Uh, she's been diagnosed with COVID. And due to some limited kidney functions, um, it, it, it there's going to be, she's got to, uh, got to go to a treatment in Denver, and um, so um, she, she's going to be leaving tomorrow morning. Uh, if, if you've been around Kim, you know she's been really, really careful, and, and so she said she's feeling okay, uh, but what she did is just asking for prayers, and so she had uh, sent an e uh, a text yesterday. So I um, want to lift up uh, those additional prayers that we have. Um, I know... Roger, did you, I know that Roger's working on the live stream. Uh, do you want me to say something or do you want to come down here? What? Okay, uh, so let me turn it over to you. Roger's got an announcement he wants to share. Um, so let me turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Vicki. That would come on up. Or, yeah, actually, I think it would be good because that way we have it. We ha well, they can't hear you when we're on the recording. So if you want to come up here, and we got to wait for Roger anyway. So I will turn over anyone else. Any other birth? Yes, David. Um, my mom's birthday is on Your mom's birthday is Friday. And, my aunt's anniversary is and their anniversary is today. So yes, so a lot of celebration here. Okay, and others. Yes, dear. And Daryl has a birthday on Thursday. Happy birthday to you. A lot of birthdays. And yes, Marilyn. A line for the line. <laughs> and your youngest daughter is celebrating a birthday today. So congratulations. Uh, up there, yes. Your mom's 40th birthday is on Tuesday. So I, we won't announce her 40th birthday. We won't announce the age or anything like that. So, but happy birthday. So. And Dylan, you have your hand up, Dylan. And, and your so your your ninth birthday is on Thursday. So so happy birthday to Dylan, his ninth birthday. Any other sharing here this morning before we turn to the announcements up here? Oh yes. And you start your new job tomorrow. So congratulations and good luck with new beginnings. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to remind everybody that there is a concert this afternoon in Emmanuel Congregational. Five dollars for adults and two dollars for students. Uh, I think I have a good friend who went out and listened to us sing. Okay, concert uh, Valley Voices at two o'clock at Emmanuel Congregational up by the hospital. Uh, Five dollars for admission. So concert this afternoon. 
All right. Any others before we kind of turn things over here? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I just want to announce that we did. We have decided on a time and place. Well, we know the place for Bible school. Um, it's going to be June 13th through the 17th. We hope it'll still be cool enough to survive in the church. Um, and it's going to be in the morning. So this is a real change. I'll need some people won't be able to help that have always been there for us and just, you know, that we always count on. So we will need new people to help. Um, and I'll probably be begging for help later. But right now, I just want you to know the date and the time so that if you can help, we'll love to have you. We'll put you to work. Thanks. Speaking of dates and times, the first Sunday of June, which is the 5th of June, we will have our appreciation lunch for, for Seth. Uh, we're going to the three churches, and we find out we're going to do a combined service that day of all three churches of Malbita and Centro and us, and the service will start at 10.30, and then we'll have a meal afterwards in the fellowship hall. So uh, put that on your calendar that uh, we're going to have a combined service at 10.30 on June 5th, and the meal will follow, and the meat will be provided. But for our church, if your last name starts with an A through M, you, you can bring a dessert, and those N through Z can bring salads. Uh, Central is going to bring the Mexican flavor to our meal, so they're going to bring Mexican food to, to go along with our... No, so the meat's provided June 5th, 10.30 service, a combined service. Thank you. And we will have more information in the bulletin about that uh, with the details on that. So thank you. Um, any other announcements, joys, concerns before we sing? Uh, let's sing happy birthday. And anniversary. And anniversary, yes. I'm going to kind of change the order of worship here just a little bit. We've got some things going on. So at this time, I invite the children now to come forward for our children's time. Good morning. Well, today I want to share with you, some of you probably have seen this, it's a kaleidoscope, but I need your job to look in here and tell me what you see. So, go ahead, kind of point it up to the light. What do you see there, David? What kind of color? What, what color do you see? Okay, all right, let's hand it up. You want to take a look? And take a look in, and, and what colors, what do you see when you, when you look in there? You don't see, oh, okay. Try, try the other eye, try the other eye. All right, what do you see now? You see some shapes, okay. You want to take a look in here, and what do you see? What colors do you see? You see pink? Yeah, okay. You want to take a look in there? What do you see? Shapes. What colors do you see? Blue. Green. Okay, all right. Okay, so what do you see? Shapes. You see shapes. What colors do you see? Yellow, green, blue, pink. Yeah. And, and clear. And clear, yeah, okay, all right. So what do you see? A bunch of shapes. A bunch of shapes. 
blue, yellow, and green. Okay. So, as I look at this, yeah, I see shapes. Now, I can't see as clear as you because I don't have my glasses on. So, um, I, yeah, I see blue and green, uh, yeah, and a tiny bit of pink. So, one thing that is so unique is really each one of you saw something very different. And that's, that's the, the amazing thing about the kaleidoscope. And yet, it all came from this one thing, this one idea, this kaleidoscope, you all saw through the same thing. So today, we're actually going to be talking about that, is that each one of us comes from a different place. So did you come from the same place that David did? Your home? No. And did you come from the same place as Braxton did? Came from a different home. And did you come from a, the same place as Dylan? No, he came from a different place. And we all have, have um, maybe different grandparents and, and different things that take place. But we all come together. And I want everyone to, would you take a look at the cross? We all come together for one purpose. And so we're going to be talking about that, is that we all come to, we come from different places, but we all come together for one Jesus. Okay? So just kind of like the kaleidoscope is that each one of us saw something different, and yet it all came from just this one thing. All right? And I think that's amazing that God has created each one of you as a unique child of God. All right? Are you ready to pray? Put your hands together. Repeat after me. Say, Dear God, we thank you for our differences so we can come together for Jesus. Amen. All right, let me go over and get some candy. Oh, thank you very much, Jerry. Appreciate the handing out of the attendance pads. So, just been informed that we are now live, so um, we are back on, yeah, oh, and I see that we've already got some folks that were waiting for us, so thank you so much for uh, your patience, and, and uh, especially for those that work so hard to make sure that uh, we're now live on worship, appreciate that. Um, let us join in our time of prayer, let us join in the prayer of confession. We rejoice in the wonder of your resurrection, O Christ, but then tend to sink back into our old ways of thinking, behaving, responding to people's needs. We can dance with the angels and all humankind on Easter Sunday, but the days following the day of resurrection cause us to slip back into apathy or despair. Forgive us when we so easily become distracted by our own cares and worries, that we ignore the needs of others around us. Forgive us when we forget your power and love for us. Charge us up, O oh Lord. Set our hearts to dancing. Give us a spirit for rejoicing, willing hearts and hands for helping, voices for praising you forever. Amen. Let us join now in a time of silent prayer. Lord, we, uh, we gather in your presence here this morning. We're thinking of our loved ones, 
our friends, our family, our neighbors, and certainly those that, um, gosh, we find it hard to love. Maybe we've uh, had some difficulty in work. Maybe it's uh, uh, something in our family that's just kind of been hanging over us. Maybe it's something that uh, um, we can't think about, but, but it's just kind of been blocking us. And so, dear Lord, we just ask that you just wash over us. We ask that uh, you just comfort us. And more importantly, that you give us and grant us a sense of your peace. Dear Lord, we thank you for our time here today. And we just ask that, that in all the things that face us this week, whether it be uh, um, an issue of COVID, whether it uh, be a recovery, whether it be new beginnings such as a, a new job, whether it be anniversaries and birthdays, whether it be just something that, that wasn't spoken here today, but you know. Be with us now as we pray to you our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, for we forgive those who trespass against us. Hymn number 558, and uh, we'll just do verse 1. We'll do verse 1 of We Are the Church. So we need Dylan. Where's Dylan? Okay. Dylan is going to help Cherry, and uh, we've got some folks. Uh, there's a handout, uh, just like last week. Now, you're not going to have the writing cramps. We're not going to be writing down as much as last week. Uh, but we do have writing utensils. So when you receive your uh, insert, the piece of paper, uh, please let us know if you need something to write with. Uh, we've, got some, uh, we've got some pencils in the back there. And I, I shared this at the first service. Um, if you get a pencil that with a broken lead or it's kind of dull, let us know because we're kind of lazy. We just kind of put those pencils back into the jar without even looking to see if, if they're still good or not. So um, uh, please let us know so that we can get those sharpened for next time. And thank you so much for our helpers here this morning. All right. It look like we're we're pretty good shape. Okay. Um, next month, our church's domain name comes due for its annual review, and um, I want you to know that our church's website is on sure footing. And I have made sure, and this is the first fill in the blank, that www.gearingumc.org is registered with the right agency and is good to go for another year. 
But that doesn't mean that companies don't continue to solicit us because they know that our domain name is up for review and so every day we get something in the mail that says you need to register, you need to register. And most of the time it's just an ad agency. It's not even the official domain registry. And that just happens. Now, if you've ever transitioned from one job to the next, you know that you've got these little details um, that you do, that you, that you know. Stuff that just comes up once a year. And, and, and I, I tell you this because next year at this time, when Francis sits there and says, do you know anything about our church's domain name and all this stuff we're getting in the mail? You can say, yeah, Seth said something about this about a year ago. So just want to let you know about that. Now, I share this story with you because um, we're talking about values. We're talking about core values. And, and recently, I came across a great story about websites, domain names, and a value. And this story comes from the hand of Max Lucado. When Pope John Paul II died, Rogers Cannonhead, who is known as a domain hoarder, registered www.benedicts.com. XVI.com, which just stands for Benedict XVI. Even before the name was announced, even before he was chosen as Pope, he registered that domain name. Now, the right domain name can actually be very lucrative. Another name, www.popebenedictxvi.com, actually went for $16,000 on eBay. Now, Cadenhead didn't want the money. He's a Catholic himself, and he was certainly happy for the church to own the domain. As he said, I'm going to try and avoid angering 1.1 billion Catholics and my grandmother. <laughs> but he did want something in return when he turned over the domain to the Catholic Church. He wanted three things. The first thing, he wanted one of those Pope hats. Second, he wanted a free stay at a Vatican hotel. And the third, he wanted complete absolution, no questions asked, for the third week of March 1987. <laughs> Lucado writes, makes you wonder what happened that week, doesn't it? It may even remind you of a week of your own life. Core values, the, the why of the church. Last week we talked about spiritual growth and vitality and for us to understand what distinguishes us from a business, from a social group, uh, even a secret group on Facebook, it is our core values. Now to be vital, we have to have spiritual growth. We need to be alive. And that means being adopted, filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the why. And then last week we talked about the how, how to grow spiritual, how to be vital. But that doesn't mean that we've arrived. It doesn't even mean that we're done. It just means that we understand our value, our core value, what sets us apart and really makes us church, defined by sharing Christ through faith and action. So today we're going to move on to another core value, Christian fellowship. And those of you that you were here last week or saw it online, you remember that I started with a joke that was aimed at me, or at least my profession. So I thought that uh, today would be no different, and, and so I would share a joke that also was aimed at my profession. There was a United Methodist pastor, a Hindu, and a rabbi that were traveling down the road when their car breaks down. And they see a farm up ahead, and so they go up to the farm, and it's late, and the farmer says, you know what, we call the, the repair shop in the morning, I've got a double bed, so that means that one of you is going to have to sleep in the barn. So the Hindu says, okay, I'll go to the barn. And so the other two get settled in, when all of a sudden they hear a knock at the door, and it's the Hindu, and he says, there is a cow in that barn. As you know, cows are sacred animals in my religion, I cannot sleep in the barn. So the rabbi says, okay, I will work my way down to the barn. So he goes down to the barn, the other two settle in, and then all of a sudden they hear a knock at the door, and it's the rabbi. And he says, there is a pig in the barn. As you know, pigs are unclean animals in my religion. I cannot sleep in the barn. And with that, the United Methodist preacher heaves a sigh, and he goes down to the barn, and the other two settle in. And then all of a sudden they hear a knock at the door, 
and it's the cow and the pig. <laughs> Christian fellowship. So you have the definition listed on the insert that's been handed out to you. Um, it's best worked uh, from the Greek word koinonia. This is, the definition is unity of spirit that comes from Christians, shared beliefs, convictions, and behavior. And so, just like we did last week, we've got a series of scripture passages. And Steve, why don't you go ahead and, and share the first one with us. The first one is Psalm 133, verses 1 through 2. It says, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. Now, now it appears that our focus here is on unity. And koinonia and Christian fellowship can be just that. But so often when we think of unity, we tend to think of sameness and assimilation and everyone in agreement, uh, unanimous. But that's not quite how I define Christian fellowship. So let's turn to the next passage from Matthew. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Now, the I here is Jesus. So if you think about it, Christian fellowship is just sharing in the life of Christ for the same purpose. And just like we did last week, we turned to the person that knows a lot about purpose, Rick Warren. Wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life and The Purpose Driven Church. And as I shared to you last week, when, when Rick Warren is talking about purpose, he really is talking about core values. Now the quote that I want to share with you, he actually starts out with a scripture passage, uh, which is 1 Corinthians. So go ahead and, and share that one, Steve. said, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. And then he writes this. Morale and mission always go together. Notice Paul says that the key to harmony in the church is to be united in purpose. If your mission is unclear, your morale will be low. Saddleback Church has an unusually high morale, an atmosphere of harmony. People working together for a great purpose don't have time to argue over trivial issues. When you're helping row the boat, you don't have time to rock it. We've been able to maintain a warm fellowship in spite of the enormous growth of our church experience because our members are committed to a common purpose. And then he quotes from Proverbs. Where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint, but happy are those who keep the law. So, for the next fill-in for you, another way to say prophecy is vision. So then Rick Warren writes this. I believe it is also true that where there is no vision, people leave for another parish. Many churches are barely surviving because they have no vision. They limp along from Sunday to Sunday because they've lost sight of their purpose for continuing. A church without a purpose and mission eventually becomes a museum piece of yesterday's traditions. Nothing discourages a church more than not knowing why it exists. On the other hand, the quickest way to reinvigorate a plateaued or declining church is to reclaim God's purpose for it and help the members understand the great tasks the church has been given. Now, with that understanding, we can focus on what does Christian fellowship mean? And why does it make a difference? And ultimately, why it should even matter? So um, let's look at it from a different angle. One of the things that I have done with this sermon series is I decided to take these words, our core values, and, and look at the synonyms as maybe a way to kind of look at a different angle, kind of look at a different way to kind of see and understand these values. And so uh, you have it on your sheet, but these were the synonyms for Christian fellowship. Brotherhood, sisterhood, charity, friendship, and communion. So when I look at this list, I do not see losing our individual identity. What I actually see is Christian fellowship focused on the same purpose. Take, for instance, this story. It was in a writing class that their friendship began. 
Manaz Shabir, a Muslim woman from India, wrote an essay about the prejudice and harassment her family faced in the suburban Kansas City town. Sheila Sonnenschein, a conservative Jewish woman in the same class, read the essay and thought, we have something in common. The Sonnenschein's religious customs set them apart from their neighbors. They often felt odd and out of place. Even though Jews and Muslims have historically been enemies, these two women began a friendship based on their differences. Soon their families came together as families, as, as friends as well. They worked hard to understand one another's faith and culture. And today, Manaz and Sheila give speeches on reaching across cultural boundaries. As Manaz says, when we speak together, we believe there must be at least one person in each audience who will be moved, who will be inspired to share someone else's world. I am not sure where our journey will take us, but our hope is that we can create a place where fear and hatred will be replaced by friendship and peace. So, working together is the common goal, common purpose. And that, to me, is Christian fellowship. That is a value. That is a core value, a very sense of the church. And we find this in our last scripture passage that she's going to uh, read for us. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brother, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Thank you, Steve. Norman Vincent Peale talks about this concept in his book, The Positive Power of Jesus Christ. He tells a story about an old cowboy uh, who shared his faith and wisdom one day at a church setting that they had. And, uh, and so he asked him, Jim, what did you learn in all your years on the prairie herding cattle? And Jim thought for a moment and answered, I learned to have great respect for the Hereford cattle. On the Great Plains, there were violent snowstorms when the temperatures plunged below zero and snow was driven by high winds. Most cattle would drift downward at a fence and they would pile up and many would die. But it wasn't that way with the Herefords. They wouldn't drift downward. Instead, they forced themselves upwind and when they came to a fence or some kind of barrier, they would huddle together, shoulder to shoulder. They would put their heads down and wait out the wind and very few died from the elements. So the, said the old cowboy, I have learned if you put your trust in Almighty God and walk every day with Jesus and stand up to your difficulties when they come along, they will break on you and you will not break under them. Can anyone agree with that? Has ever worked with Herefords? Is that about right? Yeah. I like that. The other day, I was on a Zoom meeting with some United Methodist pastors and, um, in the area. And, and, and as an ordained elder, that, that's what I'm called to do, to, to guide pastors who, who just don't have as much training and education and, and experience as myself. And, and as you might imagine, the topic with every single pastor that was on this, this Zoom call came around to one thing, and that was the future of the church. What does it mean if there's going to be a split? What information do we share with the congregation? And after COVID, why aren't people getting along? And uh, how do we stay together despite our differences? I'll tell you that myself and the other elder that was on the call, these were great questions. And, and, and it was hard, it was difficult to find the wisdom to answer these questions. So again, we come to this definition of Christian fellowship. Koinonia or unity of the spirit that comes from Christians' shared beliefs, convictions, and behaviors. And, and I'm going to share with you an additional definition, and this is the next fill in the blank. When shared values take place, genuine koinonia takes place. Let me give you an example. Recently, I've been doing some uh, reading up on the history of the United Methodist Church. 
So in 1968, and Sheridan will be able to see this because she has been going through confirmation class. So Sheridan, here's a quiz for you. So in 1968, the United the United Methodist Church came into being, and it came into being from a, a merger between the Methodists and the Evangelical United Brethren, um, often taught, called the EUBs, Evangelical United Brethren. Now, the history of the EUBs is fascinating to me because my family came out of the Methodist branch. So I don't know much about the history of the Evangelical United Brethren or the EUBs. But this story really got my attention. And it's the last fill in the blank. And it's how the United Brethren in Christ came into being. So um, here's a little trivia for you. The next time that you're at a dinner party, if you ever want to share the name United in the United Methodist Church, actually comes from United here. That's, that's where it all comes down. So dinner party, conversation right there. That's where United comes from. Anyway, so brief history here. The Church of the United Brethren in Christ is the first American denomination that was not transplanted from Europe. The denomination began as a meeting between two diverse preachers at a Grossa Versum Loan, or Great Meeting, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in 1767. At this meeting, Martin Baim, a bishop of the Mennonite Church, preached a powerful sermon that moved Philip William Otterbein, a German Reformed minister, to the point where Otterbein embraced Baim and exclaimed, Wer sind Bruder, or we are brethren. So, Mennonites and German Reformed do not have a lot in common. They disagree on baptism, they disagree on what songs to be sung, they disagree on the role of the pastor, and they disagree on how to organize the church. Yet these two people, Baim and Otterbein, they came together for the same purpose. And who brought them together was John Wesley. They liked his personal piety. They liked the way that he organized the church. They liked his emphasis on perfection. They liked his sense of core values. And they came, they were from different backgrounds, but they were united, unified in spirit to come together to create a new church. Now get this, specifically because of Wesley's emphasis on the very synonym of Christian fellowship, communion. So when we are ready to start doing communion in the pews, we can thank the United Brethren in Christ for this shared purpose, because that's where the tradition comes from. So the story of the United Brethren in Christ is that of unity of spirit in Christ. In our history, it's a story of us and what we can become. In our core values, we come from different places and different viewpoints. We don't all agree on homosexuality. We don't all agree on abortion. We don't all agree on gambling. And we don't all agree on whether the benediction should come before the last hymn or after. Very important. But core values, the core value of Christian fellowship, if genuine, well, koinonia takes place. And reminds me of this, our final story. It takes place in Milwaukee. There is a teenage boy who's got cancer, and he's in the hospital, and he's going through radiation and chemo at the same time. Loses all of his hair. And as he is getting released from the hospital, he is being driven home, and he is worried. He's not worried about the cancer. He's worried that he has lost all of his hair. He's a teenage boy, remember? So he gets home, and he uh, gets up to the front door. He turns on the light, and what does he see but 50 of his friends, boys and girls, all shaved their heads. When shared values take place, genuine koinonia occurs. I like that definition. And I think it will sustain the church and help us explain why we need to share Christ through our faith and action. Amen. I'm going to pause right now. As I said, we're going to, uh, we're going to change the, the worship service up a little bit. So I'm going to invite the gracers to come forward for the baptism. If you want.
wants to join us? Of course, yeah. He doesn't. Oh, he doesn't. Okay. <laughs> that's all right. You can. So, those dang trains. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That's all right. So, that's all right. So, I'm going to give this. Let's see. Yep. All right. So, this is yours. Kind of that way you can follow along. Oh, let me get you one more. There you go. If you can. Steve, you want to start us out here? Absolutely. Please turn to page 39 in our hymnals to follow along. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. This morning I present Brooks Anthony Gracer for baptism. Now a question for the two of you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And will you nurture Brooks Anthony in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Now, would you please turn to page 40. On page 40 is the congregational response. Do you, as Christ's body the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Andre, Allison, and Brooks now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them, that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. So, um, last weekend, did we have a little dust that came along? And um, one of the things that was uh, brought to my attention, one of the persons talked about, they weren't old enough to remember the Dust Bowl, but they remembered those that were older than them that talked about the Dust Bowl. Now, one of the things that was different, if you remember, and most of you that were part of the, the, the dust storm that we had, is that night it rained. And my goodness, if it wasn't for that rain, we would have had a very, 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 very dusty weekend last weekend. It was stuff that we're still digging out of our windows. Can I get an amen to that? So we know how important water is, especially here in western Nebraska. Especially, and if it wasn't for the water and the rain that would have come, it would have been so dusty, and it would have been made this weekend even more miserable. And so we come, and this is just normal tap water. It's not holy, but it is blessed. It's blessed by all of us that come together because we know how important this symbol is for all of us, just like the communion that we're going to be partaking in. And so I look forward to baptizing Brooks. Not only have I had an opportunity to do these to their wedding back up in Shadron and get to know them when they were students up at Shadron State Park, but also a few years ago did Lincoln's baptism. And, and we wanted to make sure that we got this in. Tra you know, no train was going to block us. By golly, we got you here. So, so Brooks, I'm gonna, I need, to, need you to come here, if that's all right. Hi. Hi. It's all right. I did this to your brother. And he, he's, he's, still, he's still doing fine. So you can trust me. All right? And I even did this with your cousin as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to take some water, and I'm going to put it on your head, and I'm going to say some words. And then your mom and dad's going to put their hands on you. Are you ready? Okay. All right. He says yes. So Brooks Anthony, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right. 
I now invite your parents to put their hands on you. Now I'm going to say some more words. Brooks Anthony, the Holy Spirit worked within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Before I give you back to your parents, how about if I just kind of introduce you to the congregation? Would that be okay? Especially with the water dripping. I think you're kind of in shock here. So I present to you our latest and newest baptized member of the Gearing United Methodist Church, Brooks Anthony Grayson. say this part in a moment. So if you are following along, would you please turn to page 43. Now it is our joy, page on page 43, now it is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. Would you please respond? Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit. Here is certificate. You're welcome. That's okay. We are all Members of the household of God, I commend Brooks Anthony Grazer to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks to all of God for and we welcome you in Christian love. As members of the of you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our Offering. Let us uh, give back to God for all of the graces and the blessings that God has presented to us. I invite the ushers to please come forward.
not going to have a prayer of thanksgiving because communion is our prayer of thanksgiving. But I do invite you to turn to page 17. Turn to page 17 for our uh, service of communion. And those that uh, stayed with us and are worshiping with us live, now would be an opportunity for you to have your elements available for you. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You may all be seated. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and shared it with those at the table and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, afterwards, he took the cup, and giving thanks to you, shared it with those at the table and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As I shared during the message, Babe and Otterbein came together for many reasons, but one that was so pivotal was Wesley. And Wesley said that communion should be taken as often as possible. He saw that as a remembrance, a memory, a way to remember exactly what Jesus has done for us. And so for Wesley and for the United Brethren in Christ and eventually on the way down the United Methodist Church, it is important to us. So we are not members of the United Brethren in Christ anymore because that denomination doesn't exist. We are members, many of us are members of the United Methodist Church, but for John Wesley it doesn't matter. This is an open communion table. So we invite you to come forward, partake. We have the elements uh, spaced out here on the communion rails and likewise on the communion rails. If you're unable to kneel, that's okay. Just stand and uh, partake in the meal. If you need communion brought out to you, please let us know and we will do that. Um, As you are coming forward, I will share communion with those on the live stream. And so I invite you to come, not as members of this church or any church body, but to come and feel that love of Christ and Christian fellowship together. So I invite you to come forward, come down, and uh, partake in the communion, and then return by the side aisles and uh, participate in this wonderful meal. Let us come. And for those on the live stream, we hope that you have your bread and your cup available. The body of Christ, which is broken for you. Precious blood of Christ shed for you.
At this time, join in the benediction. We'll read together. I am ready to go forth from this place with my eyes wide open as I journey into the wider world. I am ready to love God and see Christ in each person I meet. I am ready to give thanks, always to an end, not to withhold love from any. For I do not know who may yet turn to the light. Amen. If you'd like to stand and join me in the final hymn, uh, number 670. <laughs> 